Well, I've been listening to this guy for 30 years or more. I, cassette tapes were where we started. And, uh, and so I'm gonna sell your books here, because I, I love this. Why the Universe is the Way It Is, fascinating book. I mean, uh, just phenomenal, things you've never thought about, of how God put things together. The one he doesn't have with him was one of the most recent I've read is, is uh, The Improbable Planet, which just blows your mind, makes God so much bigger than you can ever imagine. I mean, that had to happen to you too, right? As you're studying all this, the... the yeah, it blew me away too. Impossibility <laughs> of all of this, of everything. You know, we're standing in the green room today just going, there's nothing should be here. You know, this should be nothing. <laughs> and it's just... Like you said, it's all about redemption, which is what this book is about. Uh, really, it's his testimony, but it's, this is one of the best books on evangelism I've ever read. I mean, it's just, you give so many great ideas for evangelism. I hope you guys will read it and take advantage of these and, and come at us and say, let's do some of this stuff, because he gives so many good ideas. This is the one I used to listen to you on uh, cassette tape talking about the Bible, talking about Genesis. And uh, I mean, some of you were asking little questions about the Nephilim and all the stuff in the Bible that, you know, you've always wondered about. Here you go. This is it. This will explain more about creation than any book you'll ever pick up, I guarantee you. Uh, and then the one I want to talk to you about today is, <laughs> is this one. <laughs> which is uh, lights in the sky and little green men, which is... Hang on a second. You, you have to say that title one more time. Uh, this is, yeah, what an interesting title for <laughs> lights in the sky and little green men. So right now, uh, I heard you've had this out for a long time, yes. right? It's just been repackaged. Yes. Because uh, uh, I heard you talking about this years ago. How did you get even involved in the whole UFO phenomenon. I mean, you, it goes all the way back to the beginning, right? Well, it was quite by accident. I was 16 and I was in charge of the astronomy club in Vancouver. I said, we need to have an exhibit at the Pacific National Exhibition. So uh, we had an exhibit there, but they put us right next to the Flying Saucer Club. <laughs> so people would visit their booth and then come to our booth and well, what do you think of what they're saying over there? And so since I knew the night sky pretty well, I says, well, that's not really a UFO. That's the planet Venus. Or you saw a fireball uh, or, uh, you know, a number of other phenomena. And uh, that was a time when our military was having some secret aircraft that they weren't telling people about. But I knew about it, so I said, that's what's going on. Uh, but from that point onward, Every university I was associated with, they had me deal with all the UFO reports. So quite by accident, I wound up becoming an expert on UFOs. Uh, and the thing that people don't realize, most astronomers, professional astronomers, don't know the night sky. They just plug in the coordinates and off the telescope goes. But since I knew the night sky because I was an amateur astronomer first, they made me feel all these reports. And I even wound up uh, going to Russia in the 1980s and 1990s and speaking on UFOs over there. Because uh, at that time, during the Soviet era, they were having many more encounters with UFOs than those of us in the US. And that's a lot of what I write about in this book, is that uh, number one, UFOs, uh, only 1% really qualify as what I would call residual UFOs as opposed to natural phenomena. Tell, tell them the story about the guy that called in, he was chasing a UFO. Oh, this is the California Highway Patrol. Uh, they called us and said, uh, we're chasing a UFO, and uh, can you help us figure out what's going on here? And they said, we're gaining on it. And so as they described it to me, I said, I don't think you're gonna catch it, you're chasing the planet Venus. So. <laughs> Now explain that, because most of us never have seen Venus in its full... Well, yeah, I mean, Venus in the morning sky is about 10 times, 12 times brighter than it is when you see it in the evening sky. So if you're not in the habit of getting up at four in the morning and going for a run outside, you probably have never seen Venus as a bright morning star. It can be so bright you can read a newspaper by it. It's one of the most frequently reported uh, UFOs. 
And here you had a fireball a couple of days ago here. Right, we did, all of us. How many of you saw that? Yeah, right. it was wild. That's wow. the second most frequently reported UFO, UFO. is fireballs. <laughs> and I've actually personally seen fireballs that were four times the diameter of the moon. So, and they can make sounds, they can leave a smoke trail, and often that gets reported as a UFO. And uh, I had Carl Sagan as a professor when I was at the University of Toronto briefly. Wow. And he said there's no such thing as UFOs. Uh, they're impossible. But his worldview would not permit the existence of non-physical reality. As a Christian, I do believe that there is things that are real and yet non-physical. And when you look at this UFO phenomenon in detail, that's the category. You can prove that they're real, but you can also prove they're not physical okay. entities. Okay, let's drag this out a little bit because I want to, I like this. <laughs> Because, uh, uh, you know, this is getting so much press right now. I mean, uh, Tucker Carlson's even got a little segment in his show now every week on the whole UFO thing, and they're showing videos of these things. Well, you can watch me talk about it on the History Channel, but... Uh, really? They, they edited it to make me believe the opposite of what I was really sharing with them, so oh, I'm, I'm not too happy with it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, so, do you think there are things in Area 51 that we need to know about? Not Area 51, not Roswell, no point going there. I know they're trying to make a lot of money off of you, but uh, uh, nothing's happening there. On the other hand, uh, there is in the literature over 2,000 documented cases of UFOs coming through the atmosphere and crashing into the Earth. And when you go to the crash sites, you'll see a crater. Uh, if there's snow, the snow will be melted, the vegetation will be damaged. But as you investigate the crater site, there's no debris, there's no artifacts. If it was a physical craft, there would be artifacts, there would be debris. Moreover, when they go through the atmosphere, and sometimes we've got enough observers we can triangulate and calculate the velocities, the velocities come in at about 18 to 25,000 miles per hour. And yet the witnesses never hear a sonic boom, nor do they see heat friction as the UFO goes through the atmosphere. If it was a physical object, you would get heat friction, you would get a sonic boom. That's not been recorded at any of these places. But the fact that you see a crater uh, where you've got damaged vegetation and melted snow tells you something real happened. But the fact that there's no debris, no artifacts, no sonic boom, no heat friction, tells you it's not a physical object. Now, I'm not the only one claiming this. Uh, I know of books written by six other physicists, and the other six, none of them are Christians, but they all agree with me. We're looking at what they claim is an interdimensional phenomena, real objects coming from dimensions outside of length, width, height, and time. And as a Christian, I read the Bible, and it says that God created two different species of intelligent beings one species, us humans, that are physical and constrained by the physics of the universe, and other species, angels, that are not physical, but have the power to come into our realm. We can't go into their realm, but they can come into our realm and they can leave. And so I'm persuaded that these residual UFOs, those that don't have a natural explanation, are indeed angelic beings manifesting themselves in our dimensional realm. And we're by far not the first generation to have these kind of visitations, It right? goes back, documented cases go back 3,000 years. Whoa. Now, what's interesting is you look at the 3,000 year history is that the manifestations actually keep pace with our technology. So for example, 150 years ago, uh, it was not flying saucers, it was slow moving dirigibles in the atmosphere. During World War II, uh, they were craft moving at 500 miles per hour. Now that we've got spaceships that can go 18,000 miles per hour, they're manifesting themselves as flying saucers going at that velocity. The other thing you notice is that when you get the really close encounters uh, with these UFOs, many people claim to have messages being communicated to them by beings on board these craft, and the messages keep pace with our technology. So again, if you go back 100 years, they were saying, we're from the backside of the moon. 
But once the general public became educated enough to realize life's not possible on the backside of the moon, they said, well, we're from Venus. And when people realized how hot it is on the surface of Venus, they said, we're from Mars. Now they're claiming to be from another planetary system. So I argue in Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men, this is the kind of messaging and the kind of pace with our technology you would expect from beings who have a mission to deceive us. If you actually look at the messages in detail, you can see the hallmarks of deception. Uh, probably the best example of that is when people claim to have contact with these beings and they're put into a trance and they wind up doing automatic writing, where they wind up recording uh, what these beings want them to record. The most dramatic example of that is the Orontia book. It's 4,000 pages of automatic writing from these UFO encounters. A third of the content is denying the deity of Jesus Christ. Whoa. So that kind of gives you a clue what's going on. Yeah, totally. The other clue you get from what's going on, the closer the encounter you have with UFOs, you may remember the American physicist Alan Hynek uh, back in the 60s coined close encounters of the first kind, second kind, third kind. Now they have the fourth kind. Uh, and these are where people have encounters that are closer than 500 feet. Uh, or where they get messages. Uh, but in 100% of these encounters, it's always harmful. It's never beneficial. I tell people, if you have a close you encounter... You probably ought to say that again. It's always harmful. It's always harmful. The best you're going to come away with with a close encounter is recurring, terrifying nightmares. You say, what's the worst case scenario? There's documented cases where people have been injured and killed uh, by these UFO encounters. So they're not meaning you good things. Well, so how do we stay out of fear that we're going to be encountered? I mean... <laughs> well, also, I'd like for you to back up a second for context, because when you say angels, there's also good angels. There's ministering angels that the Bible speaks of. So yeah, they're not all in the category. righteous angels and fallen angels. Good, yeah, explain the that just a that bit. The fact that we see deception, the fact that it's always a harmful encounter tells us we're not encountering the righteous angels we're encountering the fallen angels, the demons. The demons, that's what we would call demons, would be fallen angels. Well, even people like uh, Jacques Vallée, who's devoted his life to studying these UFOs, he's a French physicist, he says there's a one-to-one -one correspondence to what you see in these residual UFOs and what you see in demonology. And the other five physicists would all concur. They say, we're not sure what this demonology is all about, but there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. And there's something else I document in this book. The percentage of the population that are having these encounters is proportional to the percentage of the population that has opened doors to occult activity. So, for example, during Soviet Russia, a very high percentage of the population was having these encounters. This, Today, it's a low percentage. That, you you got to tell them that, so, how you ended up in the middle of this, because this is during... Right at the end of the Cold War. Yeah. It, actually before, right? Well, it's before Perestroika. I got a call from the Soviet government. They wanted me to come and speak in Russia. They said, we'll pay all your expenses while you're in Russia. And uh, uh, we want you to come and speak on science and the Christian faith. And now, said, imagine this, guys, because some of you younger people don't remember this. Nobody was going into Russia. I mean, this is incredible. Well, so was the scientific... Well, I went under severe restrictions. They said, we're only going to allow you to speak to PhD scientists. If we catch you talking to anyone who doesn't have a PhD in science, we'll immediately deport you, and you'll never be allowed back into our country. And they said, we're going to be watching you. So they had a KGB agent with me watching what I was doing. I said, well, why are you giving me permission to speak to these PhD scientists? And you're saying, I can speak on science and Christianity. He says, well, these are scientists that go to scientific meetings. They're outside of Russia all the time, and we're basically bringing you in to appease them because we're worried that they're going to defect, and by having you come and speak on the subjects they want to address on, this way we think we can appease them. And so well, I was sense. giving these lectures in halls of scientific atheism, and uh, when I engaged the scientists, I said, you know, every Friday we're required to go to a two-hour lecture on scientific atheism. And there's nothing like being repeatedly required to go to those lectures to convince you there really must be a God. 
So if there was no God, they wouldn't be making us go to all these lectures. So he says, we already believe in God, but we're not sure what God's all about. That's why we want you to speak on this subject. And uh, a young man who was part of the national basketball team, he was my translator. And uh, the way he would introduce me is he would point to this 20 foot by 20 foot portrait of Lenin that was behind me. He says, for 70 years, this has been our God. Now we're gonna hear about the real God. And four lectures later, he gave his life to Christ. Wow, so. wow. Jeez. Okay, so there's, a, there's a purpose. That and always be ready. There's a purpose in this, because tell them what happens when you get up in that environment and you start to lecture. Well, I was aware that this was a time in the Soviet Union when they were concerned they were falling behind the West in terms of military capability. And, uh, and so a lot of the universities there were doing funded research on occult physics because they thought that's a way they could get weaponry that they could use against the West. Consequently, a lot of these Russian physicists uh, wound up deep into the occult, and many of them were demon-possessed. And what was interesting is when I would give talks there at that time in Russia, everybody believed in demons, because they said, we just see it all around us. I didn't have to convince them of it. They, they got to see it firsthand. Uh, but they also got to see firsthand the power of God. But just, just real quick, though, just to help us with what you mean, you, they're exposed, they believe in demons, they're exposed to demon activity. What's that mean? Like, what were they exposed to exactly? Well, for example, I would walk into this lecture hall, and there would be half a dozen of these physicists screaming and yelling and preventing me from speaking. And they're screaming and yelling. They were basically attributing to Jesus horrible uh, moral problems. Uh, for example, accusing him of being a homosexual rapist. I mean, I hear people taking the Lord's name in vain here in the U.S., but they don't cross that line. I mean, and just these huge obscenities coming, all directed, and of course they were directing it to me as well, screaming and yelling. And uh, the other physicists would say, oh, just ignore them, they're demon-possessed. Uh, so, <laughs> but, <laughs> they were screaming and yelling to such a degree, I couldn't give my talk. And so I just went straight to Q&A. And again, the people who were demon-possessed were screaming and yelling. It was interfering. So I told them, look, how about if I come back? Uh, but can I bring a colleague with me when I come back? So I had another American, a scholar, come with me. And I said, I want you to sit at the back and pray that the demons will be silenced. He did that. And for two hours, not a peep out of any of those people. You even got them, so. And I but got they to give were, my talk. They were doing this to gain an advantage over us militarily. They were, they were in... Well, they said, people in the West aren't doing this. We'll do this and see if we can come up with some kind of super occult weapon. Uh, that never happened, but a lot of physicists wound up getting very deeply involved in the occult. They were seeing UFOs all the time, and uh, some of them even got demon-possessed. So it wasn't good. Wow. Now, now the perestroika came in, the Soviet Union has gone, the incidence of UFOs has gone way down in Russia, mainly because there isn't anywhere near the involvement of the occult that there was before. However, it's still quite prevalent in France, Equatorial Brazil, and that's what I write about in the book is that the degree of these UFO encounters is proportional to the percentage of the population that's involved in the occult. But I basically tell people what we're arguing here is a scientific model on UFOs. Namely, if you open the doors of the occult, don't be surprised if you get these encounters. But if you close the doors, that'll be the end of it. So I basically end the book by saying, these are the ways that you can open the doors of the occult. Get all of this out of your life. That'll be the end of your UFO encounters. They'll never happen again. With one important caveat, you can get visitations if you've got a close relative that's into the occult and you've not agreed with God in prayer that what they're doing displeases him. That's how you cut the intergenerational links. If you've got a grandfather or an uncle that's into this stuff, simply agreeing with God in prayer that what they're doing uh, displeases him and is wrong, 
that cuts the link between that relative and you and protects your children and your grandchildren. You, you uh, had an incident. I mean, you get pulled into a lot of this stuff. I mean, basically after that, that <laughs> little science club thing, you ended up being one of the top investigators, right, in the country on, on UFO sightings and that kind of stuff? Well, what would happen is, let's say, the University of Toronto or Caltech, they would say, we don't want to deal with this stuff. You know the night sky. This is your job. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd be the one. So I was the one. <laughs> and you found, you found links to a lot of those scenarios, a lot of the, the people well, had Well, what I share with, with Christians is when you run into this demonic stuff, deal with it, but don't chase it. Because keep in mind, the demons can That's divert really you from meaningful uh, ministry. So yeah, if it so, comes across you, deal with it otherwise, but don't go after it. So it expanded a little bit. Tell them the story. I, th this was a, one of the most fascinating of the couple who had moved into a new home. Uh, yeah, it was a couple in our church. They just bought this home, and then they called me on the phone and said, you know, there's a room in our house that's colder than all the other rooms, and it's a room where we see stuff floating in the air. Uh, we think there's a demon in there, <laughs> and uh, we think the previous owners left some article. We've looked for it. We can't find it. Uh, could you come over, and uh, let's see if we can find, because they knew enough from taking my classes. There had to be some invitation in the house that was permitting the demon to stay. So I went over there. We had about a 15-minute prayer time, and I said, well, they said, we've already searched the house. Said, let's search it again. So we went through the whole of the house. I especially went into that room, and I noticed it had been repainted. So we found a spot where the paint hadn't covered it, midnight blue. And I said, well, midnight blue is a favorite color for people holding seances. So uh, we talked to the neighbors, and they said, yes, there was two teenage boys. That was their bedroom, and they were holding seances in there. And then we looked on the wall, and we found a very faint octagonal outline that had been painted over. And I said, we need to find that article. That's probably what's causing the demon to stay. So he searched through the house, and finally we went into the garage, and there was a pile of junk lumber and the rafters at the top part of the garage. And I said, if you look there, and he said, no, that's just junk lumber. He says, we're going to pull it all down. We pulled on all the junk lumber, and there was an octagonal astrological forecaster. So we destroyed that. The room returned to normal. Everything's fine. The demon's gone. Whoa, very interesting. Okay, so in, in, you think that's what's literally taking place, is that we are, are being visited by extraterrestrials, but not of the... There really are extraterrestrials, but they're not beings like us. They're not constrained by the laws of physics. They transcend the laws of physics. And keep in mind, in uh, Hebrews 13, it says many of us have entertained the righteous angels unawares. And in Hebrews 1, it talks about how God sends his angels to assist us in ministry. And you see this in the book of Acts, you know, where an angel comes and rescues Peter. And uh, I believe that kind of thing is happening to this day, uh, but often in ways that we're not aware of it at all. So the, the UFO phenomenon is really aimed at creating fear. Yes. Really harming us. Well, I think the goal of these uh, demons is to scare you and divert you so that you don't submit to the claims of Jesus Christ or what the Bible is saying. They're basically trying to divert you, and where people get killed, they're trying to have your life end before you give your life to Christ. So we could really say then that the fruit of what we would call demonic activity is very anti-Christ. It's very anti-Jesus. Very much anti-Jesus. Fear-driven right? and proving that Jesus is not real, that he doesn't exist. That's what it's all about. And even if you look in the United States, we can see there's a correlation between UFO encounters and the percentage of the population uh, that are into New Age stuff and spiritualism and the occult. Wow. By the way, Missouri ranks quite low. Interesting. Hallelujah. Yeah. <clears throat> However, let me ask you a question because I'm just imagining, you know, say somebody has a neighbor or a friend or even a relative and they're saying, ah, yeah, they, I've seen them do some of 
the, you know, the occult activity, but maybe not call it occult activity. They're just, you know, seances or participating in this kind of, because a big term these days is I'm just spiritual. You know, I'm not Jesus-centered or I'm not even really any established religion-specific but I'm spiritual, and they're engaging in quote-unquote spiritual activity. But they're a good person. They're really kind. They're really nice. What's wrong with that? I mean, it's innocent, surely. How would you respond to that? Well, a lot of people think that everything spiritual is good, so there's no harm in whatever spiritual thing you pursue. But if you look at 1 John 4, 1, it says, test the spirits to see where they're from. So there's a warning there that not every angelic being is there to do you good. You need to put them to the test. And the whole of that chapter tells you how to put them to the test. So I'd recommend, in fact, you know, one of the things I just tell to people in our church is, if you've just given your life to Christ, you want to read and better yet memorize uh, the first epistle of John. I believe John wrote that first epistle as an introduction for brand new Christians. Interesting. First John. First John. Just uh, to let you know, if you're dealing with demons, <laughs> and I don't know any other way to say it, we have a ministry here called, is it Steps to Freedom Still is the name of it, that would help you enormously. I mean, uh, we just took a whole crowd of people through that, and uh, that would be a, an you know, introduction to finding freedom here. So or if, if they've got a relative that they want to help. Yeah, if you've yeah. got somebody else that you want to help. That would be important to go because through. Because the, the redemption truth in all of this with the reality, I just appreciate you from a scientific point saying, no, 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 there, there's reality in these, you know, spiritual beings that are not physical. And yes, some cause harassment, but this is the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is that we don't have to be harassed and live in the fear that these invisible or these non-physical beings can can you know in, inflict upon us in the name of Jesus as a born again Christian, we can live free of that fear. Is that, that's what I hear you saying, well, right? That's one of the tests you see in First John. God has not given us a spirit of fear. That's right. But with this demonic, you can expect that there will be a spirit of fear. Because I'm thinking be of just the growing fear. anxiety in our culture today, just the growing of fear, and we may not see our tables floating around or anything, or even any real clear occult activity. But even with that invisible influence, or I always call it harassment, you know, of demons, there is freedom that can really be found in the gospel of Jesus. By, and you're saying 1 John 4, right? 1 John 4 is a go-to chapter to grow in that. Right. It's good. <clears throat> okay, let's, let's change channels, because uh, you said something last night. Well, you've said this, I've heard you say it numerous times that the two big obstacles, especially for our young people right now, are that in church, they have not been equipped with science and they, they have not gotten their questions answered. Now you have a way better, clearer way to say that. Say, say it again, those are the two. Well, this is a Barna survey done about young people who've been raised in the church, they got Christian parents, and once they hit the late teens or college years, they leave the church and never return. So they surveyed thousands of them to find out, why did you not go back? And the number one reason was the science faith issues. Number two, no freedom to ask questions or engage in debates and challenging discussions in the church. And hey, if you look at the book of Acts, that's what it was all about. I mean, the apostles invited questions and debates and challenges. And so that's what I love about Grace Church here. You're wide open to people coming with their toughest questions. And it's something I'm trying to encourage in all churches through reasons to believe is you need to have regular venues where people can ask their toughest questions. After all, take a page from uh, uh, King David. If you read the Psalms, he was always pestering God with really tough questions. And sometimes God made him wait for the answer. And sometimes God made him research the answer. And I think we can use that as an example. That's how we should operate in the church. One thing I can share with you, I haven't spoken in hundreds of churches in America. Every church I know where they follow the message with an open mic Q&A is a church that grows by adult converts. So just, 
If you have that opportunity, people will come. I've watched Hugh, not, not just in situation settings like this, but even back in the beginning, debate some of the you know, brilliant minds, not just in the nation, but in the world. And so uh, uh, he's just been in an environment that is so totally opposite of the way most, the insular way the church has been. You know, we just fend off any questions or criticisms. So you've developed this ability to just clarify things. And I'm, I've watched you, you know, just in a debate, just blow the doors off of the guy that was, you know, coming at you with all these uh, arguments. I would encourage you guys to go out. A lot of that's still on the web, right? Yeah, you, I mean, can, you can watch these on the web. So one of the recent ones was a guy uh, who, a brilliant guy in, in England. What was that? Yeah, one? Peter Atkins. If you've ever taken chemistry, you've been forced to study his textbooks. <laughs> I had to go through his textbooks. I did not know that he was an atheist, and turns out he's a leader in the British humanist movement. But I was in London a few months back. Uh, I got to do a debate with him. It's, it was video recorded. You can watch it online. Uh, Ross versus Atkins will pop it right up. And, uh, Help me remember that. I want to watch this. Yeah, I mean, it was a, quite a dramatic debate in that for a whole hour, Peter Atkins was saying, you have to base your belief on hard scientific evidence. And so I was giving the hard scientific evidence. He wasn't really coming up with anything for his atheism. And finally, the moderator of the debate said, Peter, uh, well, first he asked me. He said, Hugh, what scientific discoveries would cause you to abandon your Christian faith and become an atheist like Peter? So I rattled off a whole bunch. I said, you know, if you, we could prove beyond any shadow of doubt the universe didn't have a beginning, that would be catastrophic to the Christian faith. If we could prove we human beings are just like the animals, there's nothing special or distinct about us, that would be catastrophic to the Christian faith. Then the moderator turned to Peter and said, okay, Peter, what scientific evidence is what it caused you to abandon atheism and become a theist or a Christian like you? And he said, there's nothing. And then he pressed him and said, well, what if God were to appear right before you in this room? Would that be adequate evidence? He says, well, I would think I was having an hallucination. In other words, evidence didn't count. Wow. <laughs> and yet for a whole hour, that was his message. You gotta base your belief. But when push came to shove, it didn't apply to him. This, this uh, book, Navigating Genesis, really will just, I mean, for, your, for the sake of your young people in your families, we please. We actually talked about that with Peter Atkins. Yeah, so. please read this book. Um, just, uh, man, time evaporates with you. I, I don't, I think we're gonna have time to go through all kinds of things and now it's, you know, I wanna give everybody a chance to be a part of this. Um, just as simply as you can, this, this was a major turning point for me, understanding the global flood. That was a huge, huge uh, difficulty <laughs> in talking to people outside the church because this is one of the first things, you know, that a, a, an unbeliever will bring up is how in the world and, you know, and there's no proof on Mount Everest that there was a flood that flooded the world. Just... Give us a... I get that from atheists all the time. They say, how can you possibly believe in this book that teaches a global flood? And I said, well, where did you get that from? And it uh, turns out they really haven't read. Uh, and with people in the church that think that, I say, well, the flood is not just described in Genesis 6, 7, and 8. There's many places in the Bible it talks about the flood. And before you draw a conclusion, you need to read all the Bible passages that address the flood. So, for example, in 2 Peter 2, 5, it says that God flooded the world of ungodly people. In 2 Peter 3, it says he flooded the world that existed at that time. The very fact that the Greek word cosmos, translated world, in both cases is qualified with an adjective, tells us it's not the whole globe. It's the world of ungodly people that was flooded. And we know that ungodly people had not yet inhabited Greenland in Antarctica. So there's no need to flood Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, but if you go into the poetic books, Psalms, Job, and Proverbs, you'll see seven places there 
where it talks about creation day three. And that's when God transforms our planet from a water world into a world with oceans and continents. Probably the most detailed passage is Psalm 104. Verse 6, 7, and 8 talks about creation day 3, uh, when God puts these uh, continents in place. Verse 9, which immediately follows, says, never again will water cover the whole face of the earth. Basically making the point, once you've got continents, we're never going back to a water world. That's repeated six times in the poetic books. And so just reading all those texts, we realize, oh, it's the world of ungodly people. And if you look at Genesis chapter 10, it talks about when humanity went from being in one locale to filling all the land masses of the world. And the flood takes place before that global spreading event. And so it's not necessary so for ba God. Babel was after the flood, right? Babel was after the flood. So before that, they're after, all... Yeah, they're all in one place. In fact, what you see in Genesis 11 is God is basically rebuking humanity for their failure to fill his command, multiply and fill the earth. He gave that command to Adam. Adam's uh, uh, descendants did not obey that command. He gave it again to Noah. And once again, we see that Noah's descendants did not obey that command. And so in Genesis 11, God steps in and forcibly scatters humanity over the whole face of the earth. Why? Because God knew that if you got one nation and one government, that government will oppress all the world's citizens. But if you got multiple nations and multiple governments, there's going to be competition for citizens, and that's going to lower the degree of oppression. Won't eliminate it. I mean, every government tends to do things that are not best for its population. However, the United States, for example, has hugely benefited from nations that were oppressing their citizens, and we were not. So they left their nations and came here. And that's also why you see the text saying multiple languages. The different languages, the different nations, the geographical barriers actually establish a free market competition for citizens, which is not possible if you've got one nation and uh, one government. And that was God's goal. He did not want evil to multiply again. And then people also say, well, what about all the animals being destroyed? Well, if you look at the book of Leviticus, it makes it clear the only animals that can be damaged by human sin are the nephesh animals that are bonded to human beings. And in the flood account, uh, Genesis chapter 7, it uses a special word uh, for uh, the animals that were destroyed by the flood. And uh, that word means the nephesh animals, the soulish animals, that are bonded to human That's beings. Incredible, isn't it? So I don't think there are any polar bears on board the ark. I don't <laughs> think there are any emperor penguins or kangaroos on board the ark because none of them had contact with human beings at that time. It's amazing. Uh, but as the book of Leviticus says, says, if a cow's got the habit of goring other animals and other people, the owner is to be spoken to. And if a cow persists in that behavior, the cow is to be killed and the owner killed along with it basically making the point, the reason why that cow is behaving that way is because of its evil owner. Keep in mind the soulish animals are motivated to bring pleasure to their human owners. And if bringing pleasure is to be vicious and attack other things, that's what the animal will do. So vicious dogs are not sinful. They're simply doing what makes their owner happy. I mean, vicious dogs are owned by vicious people. Uh, next hey. time you're out there in a neighborhood, keep that in mind. <laughs> wow, that's, that's interesting. Okay, so I got one more question, but while I'm doing that, why don't you first get let's everybody have, Let's up. have our two microphone guys go ahead and get in place. All right, so Eric had a question earlier that I don't think I'd answered. I, wanna, I, wanna answer, I want you to answer for me. Uh, he was asking if Adam and Eve were in the garden and they were given the option of eating the tree of life forever if they hadn't sinned. Uh, being on a planet that has a time cutoff point, cut off point how does that work? Is that, well, is that accurate? Is that more what you were asking? Um, yeah, I was, well, I guess it goes along with, you know, the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Like, Jesus 
died when the world was founded because we were going to fall into sin. I guess that, I feel like that's where you're coming from, like theologically, saying that God knew we were going to slip up. You know what now, I mean? God knew that, but I think this is an interesting speculation. What if Adam and Eve had not eaten of the tree of good right. and evil, but had eaten of the tree of life? They would have lived forever. Uh, they would have been without sin and evil. And because the universe is temporal and the earth is temporal, God at some point would have to take them from this universe and take them into the new creation. Now, he's going to do that with us because he's promised there's a new creation coming. However, God knew ahead of time that Adam and Eve uh, would rebel in the Garden of Eden. And I believe on purpose, God invited Satan to come into the Garden of Eden. And he knew that Satan being the most powerful and most intelligent creature he ever created, that Adam and Eve would be no match uh, for Satan. So in one sense, God caused the fall uh, by exposing Adam and Eve to the temptation of the most powerful being he created. But that opened up an opportunity for us to be eternally redeemed because we were now being exposed to evil in the greatest context possible in God's creation. And if you can pass the test of the greatest possible uh, exposure to evil, then nothing else is going to dissuade you. And so no human being gets to the new creation without being tested uh, by the temptation from Satan. And would you back that up with the scripture where it says, God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he might have mercy on all? That's correct. Okay. I mean, an analogy I shared the last time I was here is those of us who have a PhD, uh, we have a guarantee that never again will we have to be tested for the competency in our discipline on the idea that we've already been exposed to the most difficult uh, test that's conceivable within our discipline, so it's pointless to test us again. <laughs> Likewise, God is exposing all of us to the most difficult tests, and if you pass that test, there's no point testing you again. That's how we become eternally secure. But here's the big difference. God says there's no way you can pass that test without my help. But if you come to me for help, I guarantee you'll pass the test. That's good. Wow. <laughs> okay, here's what we're gonna do. It's, it's almost the top of the hour. We're gonna go to 1210, just so you know and can plan ahead. We're gonna begin to, if you have questions, go ahead and line up behind each of the questions here. We also have many that have texted in. We're not gonna be able to get to all of them. Uh, however, uh, Dr. Ross is always on his Facebook page interacting with people and answering questions. And we also have a, a Reasons to Believe chapter that meets here on Monday nights as well, always going through Dr. Ross's stuff and, and engaging some of these questions. So we do ask that if you do have questions to keep them to brief so that we can get through as many as possible. Then at 10 after, we'll do a formal dismissal. We have Grace Kids going on. You gotta go get your kids. But we will continue with Q&A probably till about 1230 but at 1210, we're going to have a formal dismissal, just so you know. How, how many of you would be interested in having him back more than one time a year? Yeah, I thought that. That's, that's interesting. Okay. You got an option for that. Butch, we're going to write right down here. Uh, I have a quick question, too. Number one, what answer do you have to your Jewish friend who says, who's, um, who's angry with God? He said, where was he? when he lauded all those things to the Jewish people. Number two, the same person says, my religion does not believe God has a son. Okay, can you help me? What was his first turn, question? Was turn one? this uh, monitor up. We're just not hearing that. Let's do question one. Yes, two questions. One, your friend who is angry with God saying, where was he? when Hitler did all those things to the Jewish people during uh, the time of uh, the... Um, yeah, well, that's a, actually part of my conversion was looking at the Bible and what it said about the Jewish people and uh, how uh, the Jews rebelled against God because God had set them up to be missionaries to all the nations of the world. He purposely put them at the juncture of three continents where people would be forced to go through the land of Israel in their trading. And this is supposed to be the missionary uh, mission of the Jews, but they didn't fulfill it. 
And uh, he says, and what's happening is the Gentile nations are blaspheming me because of your behavior towards me. So he says, because, of, in fact, Moses warned them, if that happens to you, your God will scatter you throughout all the nations of the world. And that happened with the Roman army coming in in 70 AD. The Jews got sold as slaves to all the nations of the world. But Moses also said, there will come a time after a long time, in fact, Hosea says, you'll be a day and another day, you'll be without a king, and then your king will come. And their day is used for a thousand years. So it's basically saying that the dispersion of the Jews to all the nations of the world will be roughly 2,000 years. But Moses himself in Deuteronomy predicted God would bring him back. And if you go to the book of Ezekiel, uh, starting in chapter 32, it gives you details about the second return of the Jews to the land of Israel and the second rebirth of the nation of Israel. I remember reading that when I was 18, and I actually went to the library and dug up microfiche of old newspapers to see if everything in the book of Ezekiel about the rebirth of Israel actually happened exactly like the Bible predicted in Ezekiel. I was able to confirm everything it says happened. You know, just look up those old newspapers published in 1947 and 48. Uh, one thing I noticed is that uh, Isaiah said, the name of the new nation will be Israel. But if you read the newspapers of 47, everybody wanted to call it Zion. That the Jewish Nesset wanted to call it Zion. And at the last minute, just before independence, David Ben-Gurion stood up in the Nesset and said, no more debate, we're calling it Israel, and he sat down. And for some reason, they called it Israel. Now, David Ben-Gurion did not read Isaiah. He was an atheist. He had no idea that this was prophesied, but the nation was called Israel. And I think what especially impressed me was Ezekiel 37, where it says, there will come a time <clears throat> when the nations will see enormous valleys filled with the dry bones of dead Jews. And when they see those valleys, they will say, Israel as a nation will never happen. It's done. It's finished. And again, if you read the newspapers of 46 and 47, that's when people became aware of the Holocaust. And photos were published in newspapers, in one case showing a valley with over 100,000 Jewish skeletons in it. And people were figured out, okay, Zionism was basically centered in Poland. And yet Poland had four and a half million Jews slaughtered. And uh, they were being slaughtered not just in Germany, but in Russia. And people were saying, Zionism is finished. There will be no nation. And yet within weeks, the nation was born. Uh, what you see in the Psalms is that when the nation is born, 10 surrounding nations will join together to exterminate the nation. It actually names the 10. And they were the 10 that fought the war of independence. Uh, against Israel. And I think what really impressed me was seeing the prophet Isaiah saying that <clears throat> this nation would be at a crisis. But what would happen is that people living in the distant coastlands, a reference to distant continents, uh, will provide the gold and the silver that this new nation would need to be able to purchase the arms they needed to be able to fight off their enemies. And if you can read uh, the history of Israel, uh, Golda Meir was sent by David Ben-Gurion with $10 in her purse to New York, a one-way ticket to New York. She gets to New York, and she raises a couple of million dollars. Uh, they send her on to Chicago. She raises more money on to Los Angeles. She returns to Israel three weeks later with $50 million in her purse. And it was those $50 million that turned the tide of the war. Israel was being wiped out, but with that $50 million, they were able to purchase surplus arms from Czechoslovakia, and that turned the tide and established a nation. Wow. I mean, that's just a little bit. That's incredible. And incidentally... <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have no. to have shorter answers. We got... <laughs> well, you can go on our reasons.org website and you get a, get a list from it. It's just scripture lists. I give you all the scriptures in the Bible, the entire Bible, that prophesy what will happen to the new nation of Israel, some of which have been fulfilled, 
some of which will be fulfilled in the next oh, few years. Man. So that's a free item you can get from uh, Reasons to Believe. Good. Uh, yours, I yeah. want to jump right down here. Let's go on over here. <clears throat> so during the, uh, when Satan fell, he brought angels with him. Whenever he caused Eve and Adam to fall, it began the test you were talking about. Is that test and the reason that evil exists in our world to prepare us for eventually ruling over the angels and eventually joining Jesus in ruling over creation? Yes, you are correct. I mean, uh, because we're being exposed to this test, and because we're going to God for the help to pass this test that we can't pass by ourselves, as it says throughout the Old and New Testament, we are experiencing the grace of God, undeserved favor from God to help us do what we can't do for ourselves. And keep in mind, uh, God could have kept Satan and the demons away from planet Earth for all of eternity. But if he had done that, we would not have an eternally secure relationship with our Creator. Eternal security requires that we be exposed to the most challenging tests. So we are gaining something that Adam and Eve did not possess before they were exposed to Satan. They did not have eternal security. Uh, through that exposure, we get to be eternally secure in a relationship. Moreover, what you see in Paul and Peter's writings is that the righteous angels are watching the grace of God in action. It tells us that the angels are intently observing us to learn about the mystery of this grace. But they only get to watch it. We get to experience it directly. And it's through that experience we're being trained and equipped to do something the angels are not able to do. And so this is why a day will come, thanks to the grace of God that we're experiencing, where we'll be ruling over the angels and teaching the angels and judging the angels and ruling and teaching over everything else that God creates a new creation. Which is why you hear Paul and Peter saying, these few decades you have here on earth as a believer, run the race with every bit of energy you've got. Because you're being prepared for a future career. And you know, it's just like going to college. You wanna take courses that are gonna prepare you for a really good career. You know, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you will get to the new creation but we're gonna have different careers. This is the time to really prepare for the career you want in the new creation. Whoa. So run the race with every bit of energy you've got. Amen. And I really like what the Apostle Paul says. When you get towards the end of your life, you wanna give it a kick. Just like a miler saves the best for the last, we need to do the same. So for those of you that are up in years like I am, go for all you want. You wanna cross that finish line totally exhausted. Awesome. Okay, here's what we're going to do, and I, I just need a little help with this. Number one, I want to remind you the resources that Reasons to Believe and Hugh have right outside the sanctuary in that corner. We're going to go ahead and, and have an official dismissal, getting to get your kids and Grace Kids. Uh, just ask you to, if you could do it quietly, because we're going to continue with uh, some more questions until the 1230 mark. So God bless you. Thank you for being a part of this this weekend. Uh, again, thank you, Dr. Ross. We're going to continue with this uh, here. Okay, so before we jump back over here to this line, uh, I would just like for you to, you know, most people when they think of science, a lot of questions coming in about just simply science disproves the Bible. Yet, as, a, as an established scientist, it was the Bible that led you to Jesus. Yes. So how, do you, how would you answer that question for somebody that says, no, 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 science disproves the Bible, uh, it's, it's, you know, foolishness whatsoever. Well, I get that quite frequently, especially from scientists. They say, well, how, I, no way can I give Christianity credibility. Science disproves it. My first response is, have you ever read the Bible for yourself, or are you just listening to hearsay? Where in the Bible do you think it contradicts science? And they'll say, well, Genesis teaches that the world is flat. Give me the chapter and verse. Nowhere does the Bible teach that the world is flat. Or they'll say, well, it teaches that there was this global flood. Where in the Bible does it say that? And so just, you know, calling their bluff and getting to actually look at the Bible, 
when I do that, that's often the first time they've ever picked up a Bible. And when they pick up a Bible and read it, they're shocked by what they read and opens up a door. So that's step one. Uh, but step two <coughs> is, okay, where do you think there's a problem? And then I like to do a positive approach. Here's evidence that the Bible got all the science right, not only got the science right, hundreds of times predicted future scientific discoveries. If you want to see that, there's a debate I did with uh, the religion editor of the Skeptic Society, Tim Callahan, and uh, we debated, does the Bible have predictive power? And basically, I had a chance to lay out all the evidence of how the Bible accurately predicts future scientific discoveries and future historical events. So that just takes away that argument. And again, the Bible repeatedly says, go to the book of nature, it will show you the evidence for the supernatural handiwork of God. Science is our ally, it's not our enemy. Wow, love it. Um, since, um, so if demons can have physical effects on our bodies, like causing sickness, for example, uh, since they're spiritual beings, what do you think the mechanism might be by which they can interact with our spirit but still have physical effects on us, if they're not physical? Okay, angels have varying powers. Some are stronger than others, um, but the stronger angels can appear in any physical form that they want. Uh, so a lot of people say, hey, uh, my grandfather came back from the dead and told me all these things. It wasn't your grandfather. It was an angel taking the form of your grandfather. And if you read the Bible, you'll see instances where the righteous angels took on forms of a human being and were actually able to eat food. So for example, you've got Abraham feeding dinner to angels. So not only can they appear in physical form as a human being, they can even operate in physical ways like a human being. But unlike us, they're not constrained by the physics of the universe. So they can leave that physicality behind and return to their spiritual realm. They can come in and out of our realm, we cannot go into their realm. So they have a power we don't have. But yeah, they appear as a leprechaun, they can appear as a flying saucer, they can appear as a talking snake, uh, they can take control of a donkey. Uh, so when Balaam's uh, donkey was talking, it wasn't a donkey, it was an angel taking control of the donkey. Wow. Hi. Uh, I was in the earlier service, and I think you claimed that humans are uh, millions of years old. And I'm Not humans. How, humans. Li human life forms? Pardon me? Human life forms? Well, we do have bipedal oh. primates, like a Homo erectus and uh, the Australopithecines that lived a few million years ago. Okay. Uh, but the bipedal primates were not human. We humans have been around, on, I mean, as I mentioned, I think, in the first service, um, when we look at Genesis chapter 2, it says Adam and Eve were created in the Garden of Eden, but it tells us at that time four rivers came together in the Garden, the Tigris, Euphrates, the Gihon, the Pishon. Those are known rivers. Two are flowing today, two are dry riverbeds. The only place they come together is in the southeastern part of the Persian Gulf. During the last ice age, I was 100 feet above sea level. Today it's 300, 200 feet below sea level. And so that tells us that God created Adam and Eve sometime during the last ice age. The date range would be 15,000 to 130,000 years ago. The best scientific date we got for the origin of humanity is 150,000 years ago, plus or minus 150,000 years. Okay. So I have a question something though. in the order of 100,000 years or less for God creating human beings. Okay, well, my question is, do you believe that Adam was the first man? And if not, then how do you reconcile that with um, the genealogy that in the Matthew that says that uh, Adam was thousands of years old? And then my second question is, um, in the Genesis, you're claiming that uh, the, uh, the Bible is inerrant, but you're saying that there are essentially mistakes in it. So... Have you thought of just rewriting it so it's more accurate since you don't okay. think it's, well, it's to accurate? Be clear, to be really clear, I do believe that all of humanity is descended from one man, one woman, 
namely Adam and Eve, that God specially created sometime during the last ice age. As to how you reconcile that with the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11, if you look at all the biblical genealogies, it's clear that they're all incomplete. Uh, for example, in, you got in Luke a genealogy from Adam to Noah that's got 11 names, whereas in Genesis 5, you just got 10 names. I didn't hear you. My question is whether or not you think Matthew, the genealogy of Matthew is accurate, because if it's not accurate, then why would people believe no, in the Bible? I'm, okay. I'm claiming that the Bible is totally inerrant in all disciplines, science, history, geography, science, and practice. There are no errors in the Bible. And as far as the genealogies go, uh, you need to appreciate that the Hebrew word uh, ben for son can also mean grandson, great-grandson, great-grandson. In English, we got distinctions. In biblical Hebrew, you don't. Same thing with the word father. The word ab can also mean grandfather, great-grandfather, etc. So I think it's important we realize the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, not in English. And so we need to appreciate that the biblical Hebrew vocabulary has only 3,000 words if you don't count the names of people and cities, and therefore virtually every Hebrew noun has multiple literal definitions. So we need to look at the context to see what this inerrant Bible is saying. Now, if you want to read some articles on this, you'll find several articles at reasons.org on the biblical genealogies. And I think what a lot of people miss is the names that are included and the names that are dropped are making a theological point. For example, you'll see in the Old Testament genealogies uh, that drop a lot of names but make it a point to include the names of Gentiles and women, not just Jewish men, basically making the point the gospels for all people, not just Jewish men. Women are included and the Gentiles are included. And also some of the genealogies make a point of mentioning individuals in the genealogy, including the genealogy at least to Jesus, of people that engage in rather terrible sinful acts. So we got the prostitute mentioned, basically making the point God can redeem people from their sin and he can bring righteousness out of an unrighteous line. So look for the theological message in every biblical genealogy. You know, my kids when they first started reading the Bible said, I'm just going to skip the genealogies. I said, don't do that. It's not just a list of names. There's a theological message there you need to understand. Look for the names that are included. Look for the names that are not included. I made a suggestion in the last service that probably what you're getting in Genesis 5 are the patriarchs that survived being murdered from their fellow man. Because as you'll see in navigating Genesis, the murder rate in the days before Noah was north of 95%. The vast majority of humans did not live out a normal life. Uh, their life was being terminated by being murdered by their fellow man. And so we see recorded in Genesis uh, 5 are those patriarchs that actually died a normal death and hence lived to be eight or 900 years. And yes, I do believe those lifespans are real. They really did live that long. And there's new scientific discoveries that tell us why it was possible for humans living before the flood to live 800 years, 900 years, and why it's impossible for us to do that today. What's, what's horrifying is that as in the days of Noah, so will be <laughs> the coming of Jesus. Well, I'm thinking, oh, Lord. <laughs> okay, what's the number one cause of death today in the United States? It's not cancer. It's not heart disease. It's abortion. Oh. So yes, we are getting back to what it was in the, in the days Ooh. of Noah. More ah. people die from abortion than cancer and heart disease My combined. Put that. Lots of questions are coming in about demonic activity and those that are exposed to it, they're fearful of it. Several questions on if you're a believer and you have an unbelieving friend that has fear because of bizarre things happening and you, 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 you hint that or you, have, you think it's demonic activity, what do you say to them? What would you, if they came to you in fear, how would you lead somebody to get rid of that? Well, first of all, uh, there's 
someone who's far more powerful than all the demons combined. So there's no need to be afraid. There's something stronger and greater. Uh, the ones I'm concerned about are people who are dabbling in the occult or they've got a relationship with a demon and they want the power that the demon gives them. When I run into that, I have to try to engage in a dialogue where saying, there's something more important for you to possess than power, and that is truth. What the demons will do is give you power to take away truth from you. But what is more important in your life? Is it power or is it truth? And so I try to motivate them to re recognize the value of truth over power. But one thing I've learned the hard way, if they want the power, don't cast a demon out. Because if you cast a demon out and they still want that power, they're going to invite more demons to come back. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Is there a way you could give us, um, not necessarily an exhaustive list, but physical evidences of um, demonic possession in people, just recognizing the physical symptoms and what we could do as warrior children of God to um, combat that? Okay, I think I got your question. What are the, some ways you can recognize whether or not someone's demon-possessed? Well, I can tell you a personal story. I was walking by the street near Caltech, and there was this lady, oh, a good 80 yards away from me. I didn't even see her, but she crawled up into the fetal position and started yelling obscenities at me. I mean, I'd never met her before. She was on the opposite side of the street, and uh, she was terrified of my presence. And I was all crawled up like that, and she started screaming and yelling. Ordinary people who are not demon-possessed don't behave that way. And, and, you know, she was a good 50 years of age. So that was a clue to me. And then, then as I got close to her, she began to back away, and suddenly the obscenities were not just being thrown at me, they were being thrown at Jesus. Again, that was a really good clue. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, a lot of people will say things about Jesus but they stop short of accusing Jesus of vile, immoral behavior. Demon-possessed people, they won't stop at that line. And then, and then I look for the fear. If the individual who is demon-possessed is showing an inordinate amount of fear, something's going on. Good. Now, did okay. you have a second part? Because I didn't hear it. No, 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 okay, that's it? Yeah, no, that's okay. Dr. Ross, thank you for your ministry to this church and to me. I, in regard to scripture inerrancy, um, the basis for my belief is that the fact that Jesus Christ never questioned the word of God. Correct. And regarding the Old Testament, I have a lot of questions too, but because he believed in the entire Old Testament that testified of him takes away all the questions that I have. I just depend upon him totally. And one final thing regarding little green men. See, my stature is rather small. My last name is Green. <laughs> that is awesome. Right here. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> He'll be signing my book afterwards, so. <laughs> Here you go. Let's, let's, okay. All right. A couple months ago, my son was ordained, and I've seen the, the attack that's going on with him. Do I need to physically be there to bind the spirit and rebuke it, or can it be done from afar? Because I can't find him right now. And um, I sent this message in on a text of it, and then I seen the light go on on my phone, but it won't open now, so... I mean, I'm just seeing something going on. Well, if you're wanting to pray a prayer of protection over your son or daughter and they're thousands of miles away, it still works. Amen. You don't have to be there in person. So. Yeah, there we go. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Hugh Ross for being here. You're gonna here. have to get a lot closer to the Thank microphone. Thank you, Hugh, Hugh Ross, for being here today. Um, I, my question has to do with the children since, say, World War II and later. What is causing birth defects in our children? And I heard a doctor on TV say that antibiotics can cause birth, birth defects in children also. 
So I'd kind of like to know because I have a Down syndrome grandson. Okay. I've read some scientific literature on antibiotics and uh, what they can do to the unborn child. What I can tell you is it's not a settled issue. There are scientists saying the antibiotics have no effect on the newborn child. Others are saying it definitely does. And a lot of them are trying to claim that things like dyslexia and attention deficit disorder and autism uh, may be caused by giving young children uh, antibiotics or giving a pregnant woman antibiotics. Again, that's not proven. I mean, there's evidence, but it's not yet proven that that's the case. There may be other causes that are responsible for this. And one of the reasons why there's some skepticism in the scientific literature, we don't see an increase in these problems in the population after antibiotics began to be used and before antibiotics came, came to be used. The problem was people thought they were seeing an increase, but what they realized is 150 years ago, before antibiotics were being used, people weren't keeping the kind of records they are of dyslexia, uh, uh -huh. autism, uh, that they do today. Uh, whereas today, there's much better diagnosis and people think there's an increase. Uh, and I think one of the evidences for that, the ratio of men and women having these disorders has not changed before antibiotics and after antibiotics. On the other hand, it, I think it's a really good idea to take as few antibiotics as you can get away with. Why? Because there's good scientific research showing antibiotics will damage your microbiome. Those are the microbes that are in your digestive tract, and they're crucial for maintaining your health. And incidentally, they're also crucial for maintaining the health and operation of your brain. If you want to really have a good, sharp mind, make sure you eat your vegetables so that you can feed that, those bacteria in your digestive tract. And incidentally, those of you who got a really good microbiome, if you go to Massachusetts, you can sell uh, your feces. <laughs> Because <laughs> what they're now doing for people who've no, got no. a damaged microbiome, you can get a fecal transplant. So, no. not just before no, lunch, no, no. right? <laughs> okay, we're going to have to call it there. I apologize for those that didn't get there. Again, you can interact with Dr. Ross on his Facebook page. Guys, on your way out, hit the resource table, get some resources. Let's give Dr. Ross a big hand. Thank you. Thank you for the weekend. Thank you.